what's up everybody welcome back for episode 17 i am happy to be alive today what about you i i think so you don't sound like it oh sorry i'm very happy i am happy to be alive today because today we're doing an episode on near-death experiences yay yay i mean they're alive right well yeah they're they're alive now right they they were near now they're far (laughs) that's a celebration and also i want to apologize for last episode on episode 16. what happened because last week i was editing episode 16 and we just sound tired oh do we do we sound sleepy we sound sleepy and we sound tired. What I think, happened? I don't know because we I was recorded that. kind of good. I know, but we recorded that episode in the afternoon. Maybe we're feeling relaxed. Do you know what it was? Is because I had that massive workout at the gym. Because I went to oh, the gym. At, gains. I went to, no, I didn't lift weights. I did cardio. Oh. I did an hour, what about an hour, 20 minutes of cardio. Okay, what was my excuse? I don't know. You were sleeping. I think you were just getting up when I got back about 10 o'clock that morning. Oh, yeah, maybe. So today, um, although Why the episode put my is going there, to be, by the way? although today's episode is going to be about er- a near death experience, I didn't want to really go into anything scientific about really? this. I didn't because I was, I started off just reading stories oh, okay. about people's near death experiences. Sure. And as I was reading the stories, every experience was similar. Right. So if I just read stories, I'm just going to read the same thing over and over again. Some of them very slightly in their stories, but majority of them were the same thing. Uh, Yeah. So like I said, I didn't really want to get into science on this thing, but to start off with science. Now, near-death experiences, over the past week, I've watched hours and hours, and I'm not kidding, of research on near-death experiences because there is a lot of it out there. Right. I watched a lot of the university lectures, not just people telling their stories. I watched the lectures from um, the actual doctors that does this research. What I found out, most of this stuff is anecdotal evidence. Right. So there's not a real science-based evidence well, behind it at it's all. impossible. I wouldn't say it's hearsay, but there are stories of a lot of, a lot of people having these experiences. So, and you can't even put it in as theoretical either. Right. Because there's nothing to put it together to make a theory of it. Well, you can't, because how do you t- know what people's brain waves are doing? You can actually do that I if mean, you put people in a activity. state. You can oh, yeah. put people in a state, sure, but it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. They don't go into REM. No, it's not even. It's not considered REM sleep or well, that's anything what I'm saying. like that. So how do you? How? What do you do on that? Yeah, it's nothing. You could. You could only catch people at that time, and a lot of times the near death experiences could be just a matter of hours, could be minutes hours or what have you right i mean like i said you can't even really chalk it up to be theoretical because the big bang was theoretical we don't know exactly how it happens just with the data that this astrophysicist put together and they said this is the theory of the big bang so they don't know exactly and the same thing with this the near-death experiences right with this i've seen a lot of research on this subject was done on people during cardiac arrest. Right. And cardiac arrest is different from just having a heart attack because people equate them together. When you have a heart attack, you can have a cardiac arrest because your heart stops. If the muscle in your heart starts to die and you're mm-hmm. not getting enough blood and oxygen, you go into cardiac arrest, ventricular tachycardia and all that stuff, and you're... Nobody knows what that means you're dead. but you. Right. <laughs> But what ventricular tachycardia is, is a lethal rhythm. Okay. Okay. Lethal rhythm means you you, you could die off of it. Sure. So when these people. Is that like the Widowmaker? No, the Widowmaker is 
um, a vessel in the heart. Okay. That goes down the heart. And when that gets blocked off, so it just causes a blockage and that blockage, you know, decreases the blood flow to that area of the heart, causing the muscle to die. And that is the survival rate is rare. The survival rate, yes, is is rare. It's low because it's one of the main arteries that feed feeds the oxygen to the heart. Scary. It is scary. That's I mean, that's what I do every day. Yeah. Anyway, I don't want to go into cardiology, but going back to, you know, the near death experiences. Yes. But it looked like a lot of the research was done on people during cardiac arrest. Because most of the time these people are brought into the hospital. Right. And just for instance, if one of your family members pass out and they're not breathing, can't get a pulse, you mm-hmm. start CPR, they take you to the hospital. Right. I, I'm trying to, I'm just trying to recall because like I said, I've went through a lot of research and a lot of these lectures, but they kind of contacted or somehow got a hold of these patients that had these experiences. So Mr. Jones uh, went down and he was down for 20 minutes. Right. So some of the universities that are doing this research contacts Mr. Jones and goes, go, Mr. Jones, did you have anything? Do you remember anything from this? Right. And Mr. Jones goes, yeah, I remember this. Or no, I don't remember that. Anyway, the one of the universities I did focus on is in our area, University of Virginia. Right. The University of Virginia has done a lot of mm-hmm. research on this subject. Yeah. They started doing research back in 1967. Wow. Over 50 some odd years That's in research. Time. It's in the medical department. Oh, okay. The division is called the, the Division of Perceptual Studies is the name of it. The Division of Perceptual Studies. It was founded in 1967 by Dr. Ian Stevenson. Like I mentioned, over the past 50 some odd years, Iron they've done Ian. <laughs> however you want to pronounce it. I'll spell it I-A-N. <laughs> That's Josh and you. Okay. With the University of Virginia, I focused a lot on the, their research because it seems like they went back the furthest. A lot of it is, or not a lot of it, all of it is anecdotal evidence. Right. But with this um, division of perceptual studies, they have different disciplines in the medical field that's participating in these studies. So it's not only neurologists or philosophers or you have trauma surgeons, regular medical doctors, um, cardiologists. So like I said, there's several disciplines of physicians that are doing this study. What you see the most most of the people see the same thing. Right. One main thing everybody always says they see. The light. The light. Yeah. Some people say, you know, they see loved ones. Mm-hmm. Loved ones meet them. Or they even have accounts of people that they never met before. Right. Just in the room talking to them. They've had accounts of people that during their near-death experience, they saw a family member. Right. But no one knew that family member had passed away. That's the crazy part. Yeah. There's one of the stories during one of the lectures that a young boy had a near-death experience. And in his vision, or I don't even know what to call it, but during his experience, he saw his older sister, which his older sister was away in college. Right. So when he woke up, he told his parents that he saw his older sister and they were wondering, like, how did he see her? She's away in college. So they called her. They called the university Mm -hmm. and they told the parents that she just died a few hours ago in a car accident. Wow, that's crazy. And his sister, what he remembers, his sister told him that he needs to go back. So these are some of the things that are, you know, people are seeing. But what's also interesting about it is we look at everything, especially here, we're in the United States. We only focus on studies and research only based in our country. 
Right. Because we see a, everything comes up on the internet is right. usually just here. Right. But I mean, this is this is worldwide. This is not only a United States phenomenon or, or American phenomenon. And they were talking about people of other cultures and the experiences that they have. Right. Because they don't see the same thing or their culture doesn't perceive life the same way we do right. in our culture. Sure. For instance, a third world country, they're not going to see a light. They're not going to see pearly gates or they're not going to see anything like that because they're not familiar with that in their culture. Right. Some of them will say they went into a well. Right. Some of them went into a cave. Cave, yep. They went into like a pond or something like yep. that. So these are different experiences that people spoke about. So, and it's, it's Which weird. is kind of cool, right? Yeah, well, it's, you know, the weird thing about it is, again, I'm trying to stay away from science of it, but near-death experiences is not the same as clinical death. Right. Well, because the clinical death, you would have to have zero brain activity. You would have, what? Sometimes, yeah, you would have to have zero brain activity, but I can tell you from personal experiences, we've had people in the ICU right. that had little to no brain activity that I've seen recover. Wow, well, yeah, I have heard of that. Just because the brain is not being fed this sufficient amount of oxygen sure. and blood doesn't mean it's dead. That's why when you hear people talk about that, they'll say, well, I was clinically dead. No, you can't be. Why do you say that? You can't be. because clinical death when is when they call it they call it right but you're truly not clinical dead clinically dead what's cl tell me the difference so for instance i've done cpr god maybe a million times right sure some of the patients we do get back right these patients are dead right in all perceptions they're dead sure but we brought them back right and most of them go live a normal life Right. When you die clinically, the processes of death does not allow you to come back. So if your brain dies, your brain does not recover. Okay. Got it. So that's clinically dead. Okay. Got it. You can have people that you bring back. Right. You put them on a ventilator and their heart's beating. They're breathing and their heart's beating, but their brain, brain is dead. His brain is, yeah. de is dead. We can keep people alive that way, but there's nothing there. Right. And what's interesting about that, we do a lot of topics that can go on forever. And But this one, I think I'm going to do kind of like a series on this because there is so much information out there just about this because it all intertwines with the consciousness. Right. It intertwines with spirituality. I mean, it intertwines with a lot of stuff. Right. So I think I'm going to do kind of a series. I think I'm going to do NDEs, near-death experiences, today. Yeah. And I'll focus on the consciousness and maybe go into maybe a spiritual realm of it. Sure. Because it's hard to separate it because even um, watching these lectures, these topics came up in every single lecture. Right. Because this goes back so far, pretty much the beginning of time. Cultures and religion. Cultures. And that's why I said spirituality. That's right. religion, right? Right. Well, so yeah. that's why I said I want to kind of focus on and separate them all and not talk about, about it one time. Right, right, right. I didn't want to just read a bunch of stories because, and that's what I was going to do. I had some stories that I pulled up and one of the places that I, I went to is called Endas or whatever, but I'll, I'll post a link to it. And they have a bunch of stories um, on research or like, can you call it research though? Why do you, what do you mean? On, on the near-death experiences. Can you call it research? Yeah, why? Well, yeah, I guess you would because you, you're researching the subject. The site that I went to is IANDS, International Association for Near-Death Studies. Okay. And there are a lot of studies and a lot of testimonials. And as I went to site to site, people telling their stories, like I said, they're so familiar right. that I just didn't want to sit here and just read a bunch of stories right. about near-death experience. You can read a couple accounts though, right? Well, I, I can, I'll, 
I'll kind of sum up one uh, one or two accounts. Mm-hmm. Um, one account is is a there was a thirty five year old, uh, I think paramedic in London. Right. His name was Adam Taps. He does woodwork, and he was doing some woodworking in his shop. So he went to plug up one of his tools, and his it electrocuted him. So luckily there was a friend there to unplug this tool. Oh, wow. Um, and he ran in to get his wife. L- his wife was an actual, like a cardiac nurse or something right. like that. She was she a trauma was in the medical nurse. Field. So she was in the medical field. So they did CPR on him. They took him to the hospital. Of course, they continued CPR. And he was out for a total of about six hours. Wow. And what he said he saw was everything kind of looked like gases. He felt like he had mental telepathy and that like he is almost like all knowing. Right. Because he kind of meld into the universe. Sure. This is the way he felt. He felt very serene and very peaceful. Right. And like I said, those are a lot of the accounts of people said too. Right. He also mentioned that you could have told him that he was out for 30 years and he wouldn't have known it. Right. Because he just felt gone. Um. And then he he woke up and he remembered or he told the people, you know, what he saw. I don't know if it was his wife or whomever, um, but because this was a news report from, you know, from London. But he told somebody about this story. The thing about that is the the people they tell these stories they they said like I said the they feel more mental clarity right they just I don't I don't want to keep bounce around but this kind of it kind of equates to this so they feel more feel more mental clarity and it goes to some of the research that was done on dying patients from like um, terminal illnesses okay. There's an account of this man dying and his family was around him. So his daughter was in the room with him out of it in a coma. Sure. And he sat up, plain as day, and spoke to her. Right. The other family members came in. He spoke to him just as clear. There's no fog to, I mean, his speech, there's nothing. He laid down and just died. Wow. And he was comatose for a long time wow and there are several accounts of the same thing that these patients will come back right and they talk to their family members so whatever affliction that they had was gone at that moment right and then they pass away and another interesting story i've hold i've heard him another interesting story and i've heard him tell this story more than one time, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Right. He was talking about his cousin. His cousin's not cuckoo or anything. She's not that kind of person. Sure. So sane mind and body. Right. She told him that her father had passed away. She went to go visit her father. Right. He was dead, clinically dead. Right. And he spoke to her. Wow. Wasn't a spirit, but what did he, say? he spoke to her. I don't know exactly what he said. Oh, I remember um, that I, I'm okay. I'm in a better place. What? I have a personal experience with that, but I'm not, I, 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 I think I'll break down if I even talk about it. Somebody I know very well had the exact same experience exactly the same experience where they said that they were okay they were okay they were in a better place i'm gonna leave is this somebody i know of course you know these two people you know extremely well okay but that's where i'm gonna leave it okay let's leave it but it's very interesting that how intertwined with with your consciousness Right. And your spirituality. Sure. Because when people in other countries have near-death experiences, they see what they want to see. Right. Based on their culture and based on their religion. Yeah. What's familiar to them. 
what's familiar to them. And the same thing with the people in the United States. Right. Based even here, based on what religion you are. Right. Yeah. So is it the consciousness of your mind creating this? Yeah. Or is it an actual um, spiritual or spirit experience, your soul or your spirit? Can it be all? Can it be all of it? I mean, does it have to be exclusive to? No, it doesn't have to be exclusive, but I mean, which of it is it? And that's that's the confusing thing. I think that confuses all the researchers also, right. because we've had conversations before when we were talking about dreaming. Right. People know so little about the mind. Yeah. And is the mind creating this or is it something else that's creating this? Right. The good part about that is, is that it makes people fear death less. Yeah. And I didn't even get to that part either. Oh, okay. I'll get to that one. But there is a very interesting thing that I did come across also during one of the lectures. Please share. They talked about default mode network. So the default mode network is... I was just about to say, what is that? You see me staring at you like, what? I know the default mode network is where our brain or mind wanders when the brain's not doing anything. Our mind wanders when the brain's not doing anything. This could be done through meditation. Right. Or it could be done through psychedelic drugs. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like DMT. Again, that goes to your consciousness. Right. Sure. Also. Right. So I'm going to leave that for another podcast. So I'm going to do a whole show on that. Oh, I'm going geez. to include the consciousness. Right. And meditating and drugs. Have oh, you ever well, tried meditating before? Yeah, a little bit. Not you, not like they were talking about. You should try it with me well before you before your next podcast. Just do it with me. I put out something weekly. Okay. Then do it this week. Meditate tomorrow. Yeah. Have a couple of brews and meditate. <laughs> Would that do it? Yeah, it might. Try it. In that, like I said, I'm gonna include psychedelic drugs and see okay. how that what that does on the mind. Because it seems like what you mean they're on the topic, you're not actually gonna try that. No, no. What, but what they're trying to say is that our mind and our brain is not really holding our consciousness. What is? I would be a billionaire if I knew that. Well, sure. They don't even know that. Right. So, I mean, it is a very, very interesting subject. You have, on the other hand, you have this subject criticized highly by some of the other scientists. Sure. Well, because if it's if if it's near. What do you mean, like the as far as the where Just your the mind whole goes? Sub the entire subject in Why? general, because there have been some studies that they've tried for people with near death experiences. What they've done is they've taken like a saying or words in big letters and put it on a bed, right? Right. And so, if these people are having out of body experiences, they could see and read what the words the words that's there right but there's no accounts of people being able to read words but in some of the lectures that i saw they had people that give detailed accounts of what was going on in the room right a very interesting one was a man that was i believe cardiac arrest right. no he was going through surgery and he crashed during surgery he went into cardiac arrest right right before the surgery. So he remember the doctor putting his arms by his side, making a chicken motion. Like he's flapping his wings like a chicken. Why? And that's what he wondered. Why? Right. They got him back, went through the surgery, and he was telling somebody this. And it got to the University of Virginia, who the ones who did this research, took his account. He said he remembers everything in a room and he remembers the doctor coming and just flapping his arms. Right. And he couldn't understand why he was flapping his arms. Right. What they did was they took the account. He gave permission to speak with the doctor about his surgery and all this. He was a foreign doctor, but I don't know which country he's from. I'm from the United States and I can't remember. I know people across the world listen to all kinds of podcasts, but he wasn't born in America. Sure. So he said when he was going to school abroad, the sterile techniques were different. So what he would do is after he scrubbed in, he would put his hands underneath of his arms. So that way he knew his hands were sterile when he started surgery. Okay. 
And what he was doing with his arms was he would point to the technicians and the nurses in the room where he wants stuff to go. Okay. So he was moving his arms, pointing with his elbows, and he perceived it as the doctor doing chicken motion, flapping his arms. And there are several stories about people saying that they remember exactly what they were talking about in the room. That could be a little different because you could be in what they call twilight when you have surgery. Sure. They can put you down on drugs, which are kind of semi-awake. Semi-awake. You kind of know what's going on. But you you do kind of know what's going on. But they said that they were dead. Mm in all terms, dead. And they were were floating on top of the room and remember what was going on in the room. Right. That is, um, you know, you hear the different stories. I can't remember her name that used to be on Fox and then she had her own show. She had someone come back and talk about going near death and she went to purgatory. And then another little boy, remember he was on Oprah some years back and he came back and wrote a book about heaven it's a book it's a movie is it a movie now heaven is for real oh okay i knew he wrote a book first Mm -hmm. yeah i I still remember him on oprah so and i don't i don't think i watched the movie no i tried to watch it this week but i couldn't really find it the only place i saw it you had to purchase it on amazon probably on lifetime maybe it's on one of the christian stations bet money true yeah i should check that yeah Check, check, check it. Going to switch gears just a little bit. Oh, wait a second. And also, well, you mentioned um, drugs and or people, different experiences. It's how they ended up there in the first place. Like, what if it's an overdose? And then what they... And they're hallucinating already. Sure. They're hallucinating. So their experience would be way different from someone else's. And there are accounts of people that were on psychedelics or like you said that or that overdose that are on different medicine what they saw was different from most of those what i was reading they saw actual they did see words or they they had to combine them they didn't have an experience where they saw the pearly gates or or what have you and then the one of the catholic pastors i was reading about he he wrote a book about it 90 minutes at at the gate. I heard heard that. Yeah, 90 minutes. I think he wrote a book. I'm pretty sure, but I, I was just reading his story online. Yeah, because when he, when people have these experiences, you know, they you always hear a lot about how peaceful it was. They yeah. didn't want to come back. They see their families mm-hmm. and they want to stay with their their loved ones. Yeah. And also you have people that switch to religion or they just overall become better people and right. they fear death less. Um, To switch gears just a little bit, I'm going to talk about the, there's a gentleman, A.J. Ayer. He was a philosopher um, and he went to school in England. I'm going to hold off telling a lot about what he's into, but A.J. Ayer had a near-death experience also. He was, again, he is a philosopher and he um, was an atheist. Right. He had a near-death experience that made him a believer. Yeah, a lot of people. But what was his? Was it, what, did he go to purgatory or did he go to heaven? No, he did neither. Wow. He saw nothing. No, he saw dark. Right. He saw space. Two creatures appeared that was in charge of space-time. Oh, hell no. They tried to communicate with them. Sure. He couldn't really communicate with them. Right. So they just kind of ignored him. Right. And he would just remember being a part of space, and then he was back. Maybe different people have different assignments at their near death. I mean, I know you're doing more topics, but they, they just might. Those people that have pretty different, I mean, most of them say the same, but the other ones, how do you account for it? Where is it coming from? And yeah. then they have to check history. Oh, they may have been on drugs or maybe it was this or maybe they were hallucinating. And Yeah, because the stories that come across, they have to seek out these people and these people have to tell stories. Right. And you mentioned someone saying that they went to purgatory. Right. Those are the least amount of people that they can get to tell stories that right. have bad 
the bad <laughs> bad experiences. Right. And they get very little of them right. um, that come in. It's mostly people that want to talk about their experience that had the wonderful experience. So you right. get you get both. Right. And they said it doesn't really mean anything. I like it when you have the atheist that then the atheists or non-believers of anything really, and then they have a near-death experience when they uh, testify or what have you. Their their tone, everything changes. Their life changes totally. The guy um, George Radonia, he was a good atheist, and he, I know I said his name wrong. That's he okay. was assassinated by the KGB and only woke up during his autopsy. And he has a whole story about that. Isn't that crazy? Uh, I mean, wow. just he only came alive by there. But after that, um, he didn't become a believer after life per se, but he became a priest. I don't get after it. After his experience? After his experience. Yeah, that's he became that's a, what I just yeah. said. People become spiritual. They become religious. Right. I have um, another person here that I am just going to leave some of these links. So that way, if you guys want to read some of these things, Raymond Moody, Raymond Moody was one of the, I don't think he did research with, with UVA, but he did go to school as an undergrad. A doctor told him a story about a near life experience, mm -hmm. near death, not near life, near death experience. I said life because his website is life after death. And he wrote a couple of books on the subject and he, you know, he talks about the subject and he lectures and, and he has courses. He started studying this after the story was told to him. So his name is Raymond Moody. He's a MD, so a medical doctor and a PhD in philosophy. Okay. And I think him and the AJ Ayer I'm going to talk about because he does the same thing. He talks a lot about the consciousness. Yeah. So, and I see this quite a bit with people that have the near death experience. They always refer to their consciousness. Is the is your soul your consciousness? Is your spirit your consciousness? Mm. Is your mind right creating your consciousness, or is your brain and the chemicals in your brain creating right. your consciousness? Yeah. So, which is it? Right. And that's why it's a very fascinating subject to to talk about, right. because everybody wants to know. Yeah, and and really, if it's helping people when they come back to change their entire life, I mean, I'm all for it. I mean, it took almost you dying for you to change your life, and some people really, not necessarily off topic, but they could have just a scare, and that's enough to turn them around. But and that's very interesting that you do say that. I'm going to tell some stories. They were talking about in one of the lectures, um, I can't remember which university, but people that not really having a near-death experience, right. it could be a scare or just some traumatic experience in their life right. and have the same thing. Yeah. And that is kind of weird, too, because you're not dying. You're not even near death, but you're you have near a near-death experience or this experience, the same thing a person that, that had a near-death experience right. has. Right. That's, that's really weird. Yeah, that's, that's weird in, its, in itself. Th there was a, an account that I read about a lady. She was Mormon, and she, I guess she was just in a state of despair and decided to take her own life and she was gone and she was shown her life in review i guess when she reached the light she came back repented as it were but the moral is is that she no longer wanted to kill herself she no longer had suicidal thoughts after she saw her life as a whole maybe that's part of spirituality but i think if you could do your life in review yeah. And maybe find one good thing, then I think it serves you well. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. interesting that you say that because somebody describes it as mental clarity, realer than real. Right. That's kind of cool. And and maybe that's how they wrote like the Grim Reaper or what's his name? Um, what's his name in the Christmas movie? 
Is it Scro- not Scrooge? No, Scrooge. Scrooge Are you McDuck. sure? Yeah, Scrooge is in the Christmas story. Yeah. Is, is the, the yeah. Christmas a Christmas Carol? Yeah, Scrooge. And he yeah, Scro- Scrooge, and he is such a jerk, and then he dies, or he could. He had those but he experiences. Saw, he had the experience. Yeah. And he changed. But I'm saying maybe that might be a derivative of that. Like if he yeah, could, could look be. at his life and review or look how he treated people, maybe that was his purgatory and said, okay, you have one more. Another thing that I, I came across is past life regression during this. Right. I was going to ask you about that. Again, that's a whole different topic. Yeah. Altogether, too. Sure. And that's very interesting. So, have you seen any of the YouTubes on past life regression? No. See, I, I'm. I was trying to focus Sorry. on. Sorry, I don't thing. want to go down the rabbit hole, but check it out if you can. I'm going to do that. These are my I'm, late night TVs. When I'm I, going TV to shows. do these one by one because it'll get so mixed up and so yeah. confusing. Sure. So today. We're talking about NDEs, okay. near-death experiences. Sure. Next one, we'll talk about the consciousness. And then we'll do- whole episodes, by the way. And we'll do an episode on past life regressions. Yeah. So those are different ones coming down the pike. So like I said, I want to kind of do a series on this because there is a lot of inter- information that intermingles together. Right. Just these. Right. Uh, and then, like I said, they in each one of the lectures, everybody talks about the consciousness. Everyone spoke about the, of course, the experiences that they these people had and also the past life regression. Right. So experience in other lives. And usually that's in children that they seen mostly with that. Sure. To so switch gears again, just a little bit with these experiences you have people that come back, you have people that have these experiences that are religious because this is what they expect to see right. being religious. But you have people that are not religious and they see this too. Right. You, you don't have to be a good person to have a good or um, a life changing near life experience, near death experience. Right. So good and bad people can have these and some people don't have them at all. Right. The lady on that. Uh, she she got canceled. Um, Megan, I think is her name. She said all she saw was dark. Megan Kelly. I think that was her name. She said all she saw was black. That was it. There was nothing. Space is black. She saw nothing. You go to space, you don't see stars. How do you know? Yes, you do. Why don't you? How would you not see I stars? I was listening we see to stars. We see stars because of the reflections out there. But astronauts said they were in space. And could not see the stars. That's crazy. That's what you you believe people that were in space or the people that were down here. Well, she had a near death. Who knows where she was? She was probably in her own hell. Something that I did hear also was we are all part of the universe and your consciousness could be just all part of the universe also. Oh, the matrix. Just in like. No, not not like the matrix. Sort of like. um, We're all energy. Dr. Manhattan. Okay. That you would, know how he's Dr. Energy. Manhattan is in he, all places at the same time? Sure. All times. Right. And he's at any time, at any point. Right. And that's what they were referring to, that someone, I don't know if they experience. Everybody doesn't know who Dr. Manhattan is. You're going to have to explain that. Oh, I'm not going to go. Go. Briefly. Dr. Manhattan is... Is a blue. <laughs> he can't be a superhero because no superhero can defeat him. Dr. Manhattan was in some type of particle accelerator that he got trapped into and it broke, broke all his atoms down. And he came out just this blue um, atomic being. And in his middle of his head, he drew, I don't know, I think it's, I have to remember, but it's, it's either an atom or a molecule or something that he drew something on his head. Something to that effect, yeah. But with Dr. Manhattan, just like some of the particles or electrons, he can be at any place or at any time. It's, Where did they find this gentleman? You can watch the movie called The Watchmen. Or? Or the television show on HBO called The Watchmen. Dr. Manhattan. But he's also in books. 
yeah. graphic novels. The reason why you can't beat Knock Dr. Manhattan, he knows everything. He's in every place at every moment and every time. Yeah. So if you try to shoot him, you wouldn't be able to because he knows you're going to shoot him. Yeah. So it's <laughs> Imagine no super... data being everywhere at once. Uh, at anyway, once. we're just rambling about Yeah, but go ahead. He is he is cool. You but... mentioned him, so people are going to go, "Who the hell is Dr. Manhattan?" So just like some of the the electrons that can be every place and every time right. at once. Yeah. That's our, I guess, soul. We become back into the, the right. universe. Right. We can. The one um, a, um, priest was saying that he believes that when you die, where you go is where your heart, where the state of your heart was at that time. Uh, um, mm. What if you were in dread in this yeah. sense of dread then we're you're depressed yeah do you go to or you could be fighting a war and you're shooting at someone and you get shot in the back right so what's your state of heart it's the, yeah i mean do you well, where do you go is it kind of like all dogs go to heaven like if you get shot in the back i don't know i don't you know what i mean like do you just instantly go to heaven if there was a heaven? Yeah. I don't, I'm saying like if if we're going by what he's saying, like no, I I can't really I can't really get down with that. I I don't know, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I can't really maybe get your down state with that. of mind, not your heart. I don't, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it's whatever. weird. I don't... But one thing they spoke about also that I forgot to mention that I was going to talk about earlier is I mentioned that family members have a moment a moment of clarity speaking to their family, other family members before they die. Right. There have been accounts of nurses mm -hmm. or medical staff having experience also right. while this person is having their near-death experience. Right. So they see things too. Uh -huh. Hmm. I I I didn't see a lot of that, but there have been accounts of that. Just people in the room witnessing things. What, mm, like what? I think seeing other people, also oh. like a, another person's family member, something like that. Wow. And I could tell you from again personal experience, I've seen a lot of people die. Yeah. I've been in the room with a lot of people when they did die. I can't recall having any type of weird feeling at all. Really? Never. When my grandma was going to die, she was um, packing to go. She was packing to leave. And she always would say, no, oh, my brother's here to get me. They're coming to get me. Rachel did the same thing. Rachel, that she's an in-law of sorts. She did the same thing. She was packing to go. She packed. And and my grandma, she packed and we were saying she was to laugh and have a whole conversation. And then, I don't know, months, a couple months later, when she decided to go, she kind of. Somebody else did that, too. Um, well, I know that when my mom was about to pass, she was talking about that man in the room. We get that man staring at me. She never said who it was, though. Oh, my God. What? You just reminded me of this when what? you said that. What? I just got chills. What? Everybody got chills. This story. Am I about to run? No. Why are you about to run? I don't run? know. You're about to say something scary. Do you remember that voicemail on your phone? It wasn't my phone. It was the Carlos's phone. Yeah. Uh, oh, Carlos, your brother's phone? Yeah, he still has it. But he sent it to you, right? He's, yeah. It's on one of my phones. You remember that voicemail? I do remember that voicemail. But we're the only ones that think that it sounded like mom. What me, do you mean? Me, you, and Carlos are the only ones. Oh my God! This no, there's no nobody I mean, else. There's believes no it. denying. I don't know if you want to say Lisa's mom passed away. Yeah. What year was it? Um, 2010. In 2010, and was it? A, Her funeral would have been yesterday. Which um, wouldn't make sense. I mean, I was an emotional wreck. But go ahead. That's neither here nor there. But how long was it afterwards? But anyway, s sometime afterwards, there was a voicemail that popped up on. 
it was Lisa's, within days of her Lisa's passing. Lisa's brother's phone. And the last day she was in the hospital, they kind of kept her sedated. Yeah. So there's no way she could have called someone and left a message. Right. And it was her voice. And we really couldn't understand what she was saying. She said something like, pick up the phone or something. And yeah, we couldn't understand what else she was yeah. saying. I think that was the only thing that we made out. I keep on trying to call y'all and y'all not picking up. Something like that. She, yeah, that was the creepiest, creepiest. Ugh, he thing. called us in the middle of the night. Do you yeah, remember? I do remember. And said, listen to this. And I said, no way. Yeah. No way. And then remember, we looked up the number, but it was in Arlington Hospital, not in um, yeah. out here. And I said, well, how is it that that number? And he, Carlos was with my mom when she passed. My brother was with my mom when she passed. So how yeah. did he get that? On how his did phone. he get that on his phone? Yeah, that's just that's weird. And it wasn't an old message either. Was not an old message. And I think we called the hospital. Mm -hmm. We we tried to do some heavy investigating to figure out where that could have came from. Yeah. And we remember, I think we got the room. I believe, or called back, and it just kept ringing and ringing. Yep. Yeah. That was weird. Yeah, and he, yeah, so he, he still has it, and I've asked him to play it once since then. Remember when Carlos finally came over? Yeah. And last I said, year it was two years ago. Um, November. No, yeah, no, this summer would be two years since Carlos has been over here. I thought it was at the other house or something where he played it. No, no, he didn't play it here. He played, yeah, he played it at the other house. Yeah. And so he, yeah, and everybody else said, that doesn't, that's not mom. But we, us three yeah, were going, no, no that sounds like yes, mom. Unmistakable. Especially when she first wakes up and she had that raspiness going on. Unmistakable. Yeah. So. Because I known her just about all my life too. Yeah. So. Yeah. Back to NDEs, yeah, that, that's... death experiences. To switch gears again, just a little bit. Why do I keep saying switching gears? But to know. get to a go to another subject about this, yeah. Why? And I think this will this will touch on religion and beliefs. Why do you think people are allowed to come back, or why does? Because everybody doesn't believe in a god, but. What you believe in allows you, or saves you, or brings you back. Mm, good question. Science? Uh, divine intervention? Oh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Because people die from Is it part of the state things. of your heart? <laughs> when you uh, but, but again, people that are just bad people have extraordinary near-death experiences. Sure, that's true. So yeah. I don't think it's the state of your heart. It's like some people are spared. Right. Told you, I think some people are here on assignment. That's that, you know, that it's, I, I don't know. I, I, I just, I, my belief is, is that it's something within your subconscious that's, you know, you're getting, you're receiving some kind of message somewhere in you. I know I have something. God, I just keep getting, thinking about things like this is, is, I mean, really, it's giving me chills. I'm having chills like a ghost in here, but there's no ghost. But just thinking of, you know? of recounting some of these stories, because my grandfather told me something, too, right before he died. Did he really? Yeah. Your mom's dad? My mom's dad. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I was in a room with him, and again, he was he had a stroke, and he could barely He couldn't talk, barely I talk. And he just said... Just, he said, just keep going. You're going to be somebody. Oh, wow. And he could barely talk, but that was clear as shit. Wow. You, you never told me that ever. And I still, to this day, I still don't understand why he said that. Mm -hmm. And it was clear as day because and this when, guy, when I tell you he didn't talk, he just stared. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah my, my grandfather, he, he, he didn't talk to, he talked to us, but most of the no time he's not saying, a big talker. Well, no, not only is he a big talker, but I'm saying after his stroke, remember? Yeah, he we, couldn't talk. Yeah, but he got a chance to see our son, so that was dope. I mean, I kid you not, he said that as clear as, just like yeah. I, it, it just brings me back, just like I mentioned earlier, how some people get clarity. Yeah. 
he said that to me and I could I remember sitting beside him in his bed and he said that wow. to me. And I I'm like I still to this day I still don't understand why he said that. Right. But he did. He was probably all knowing. If you know of anybody that it's ever had a stroke, they have deficits where their mouth droops and they get uh, right-sided weakness. They can't move. And some people, they can't talk. And if they can talk, the words don't come out correctly. Right. So this is what I'm referring to. So at that moment, I mean, it was just clear as day, like how I talked to him when he, I used to sit there in his chair when he used to smoke a pipe, the same thing when right. I was a, a little kid. Sure. And I think I was probably about 19 years old or something like that when he passed away. I believe so. Yeah, I think it was about 19 years old when he passed away. We had kids young. Um, <laughs> so that's one of the experiences that I have. And just going back to why people are saved. Right. It's weird. Like I said, there's people that die from less things right. by accident and they just die. And some people have like like terrible car accidents and walk away. Walk away. Yeah. Is that in divine intervention or sure. what is that? Yeah, it's divine intervention. Our son had a terrible accident and walked away. Well, he limped away. Yeah, he limped away. <laughs> yeah, he limped away. I have a couple of stories that I'll share about this whole saving thing. The first one that I can recall is when I was a teenager. Of course, we didn't go the best of places all the time and not always around the best of people. And when you say we, don't include me. You were bad. No, I, I didn't. This, you had nothing to do with this. But I was a good girl. A good Christian. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so I remember my best friend at that time and I, we were at this party. A fight broke out and we were sitting. We said, you know, F this, we're going to get out of here. So we were sitting on the curb just waiting for another one of our friends to pick us up. All of a sudden, a car pulls up and pulls a gun out and points it and about to pull the trigger. Right. Out of nowhere, Another person that I knew hit this guy in the arm with a bat. Right. Just that instant. Right. And do you know how quickly somebody can shoot a gun? Sure. Just hit him in the arm with the bat and the dude dropped the gun. Whatever happened after that, I did a backflip out of, you know, out of there. <laughs> he could have been like two seconds late. Yeah. Do you and know what I mean? Because it wasn't any BS with this. Sure. It wasn't they were going to scare us because why would you roll up like that? Right, right, right. People just don't roll up and go, hey, look what I got in my hand. Sure. And you guys probably seen some with of the intent. movies. They yeah. did it with intent. It was intent, of course, because of some of the people I used to hang around with back You're in my still a good years. boy. You just made bad choices. Yeah. So that was one experience that I can recall. The first one I can recall, I can step back just one more. My cousin... One of my favorite cousins, son of a bitch. One night we were walking from our neighborhood and we were going across the street to the store, like a dark drug or something. There was a little road, like a service road, and then there was a main highway. Right. So you had to cross the service road, go across the main highway to the shopping center across the street from uh, the development that we lived in. I was walking pitch black. It was probably about nine o'clock at night. Right. And all of a sudden, my cousin just grabs me and jerks me back onto between the cars. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what the hell? He jerked me just at that moment where a car almost effing hit me. You didn't see the car? No lights on. It was speeding down this little service road. Oh, my god! Absolutely gosh. no lights on at all. Oh, my God. I don't know. I was in front of him, so I don't know how he saw this car. Right. But had I stepped, again, a few seconds. Right. Or just out of his arm reach, that car on a service road was probably going 60 miles an hour oh, on wow. this little service road. So that's another instance that it I have. It is definitely near death, but not well, no, I'm not, I'm due not, to trauma. Well, no, I'm not talking about near-death experiences. I'm talking about how people are, like I be began off saying, how people are saved, saved or right, sure, or spared, or spared from some things, it's and like when that movie. so little that kill people, it takes a little right to kill people. Right. And the last account that I can recall is when me and your same brother that you just talked yeah. about on the phone when we were riding on the motorcycle. 
Right. For some reason, my motorcycle was down. I think it was. That thing was always broke. It was janky. Anyway, but my, my motorcycle was down and something was going on with your other brother and we went to meet them. Right. So we were speeding on the highway on a motorcycle with two people going over 100 miles an hour and the tire goes flat. And we never went down. That's amazing. You just swerved a little. No, we swerved a hell of a lot. Not just a little. You should ask him. You, you've heard that story before, have haven't you? I heard the story. This thing flailed around. And in my mind, I was saying I should just go ahead and jump off. You'd have killed everybody. I, yeah, I would have killed myself and I would have killed him too because yeah. he wouldn't have been able to control the weight. There's been such a shift Heck yeah. that it would have happened. Right. But the police officer that was following us was going, I couldn't even, he started yelling at us. He said, I couldn't even catch you going so damn fast on that motorcycle. And I said, you too lucky you're alive, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and all this. Did you get a ticket? I wasn't driving. Carlos was. Did you get a ticket? He got a ticket. Oh, okay. Oh my God. What happened? I mean, did he really, did he get reckless? Of course. He was going over 110 miles an hour. Wow. So that's another experience that I had personally that could have. How long did it go before you stopped? Oh, I don't know. I Miles? have no clue. It's just like when you get spanked by your mom. You don't know how many, how long it takes. You could only hit you twice and you think it's an hour. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. So this topic, like I said, that kind of intertwined with, you know, why these people are able to come back. Right. And to tell about these experiences. I haven't had any NDE experiences myself. Me either. You know, to talk about, but there are a lot of them out there. Yeah. They're, they're, it's interesting to say the least. Yeah. So like I said, before we wrap this thing up. But it does would intertwine with, with the past life re uh, regression yeah. because your Everything. soul may not be done, but that's another topic. Here so. for another reason. Sure. Don't seem like it, especially in 2020 with the COVID. But that's what it might be. Have you have you heard um, one of my favorite mediums says that that you before you you are born, your you get a job. Your soul is basically on a mission, and so you can never get rid of a nine to five, huh? You might. Depends upon what your soul decides to do, but you've chosen your parents. You've chosen who you're going to be. You've made a deal. With. Deal with who? The devil? <laughs> Listen, you might have, but then you have already chosen before you, your soul has already made the deal before it comes into the body, what it's going to do, what it's going to be, all of that. You know, it's just, it's similar to, you know, when you are a female and you're about to have kids, you're you're already born with the amount of eggs that you're going to have. Just like we're born with a set number of fat cells. That's it. They never go away. They just expand and they retract. Expand. <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, unless you get liposuction. Unless you get liposuction, yeah. But then it displaces the fat. And then you get lumps you get in lumps random all places. Over the place. Certainly. But yeah, I mean, it's like that. You, you, um, Your soul is already done what it's supposed to do and then if you didn't complete whatever it was then it, it says, sends you back sends you back and say we're well, you're not ready yet you haven't you have not completed what you came to do your lesson mm. yeah so so i mean like your your soul you could be reincarnated as the, your your son or your wife yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't you love to be me yeah okay for so, a day so we're gonna wrap this up for another <laughs> on that note yeah for another episode but i am going to tell one more story okay story time make it good this is a, a good story um have you ever seen anybody just die in front of your eyes no not that i can recall no i know people have been in wars and things like that and they've seen some of their you know people in their unit that I've passed seen dead away people but never yeah people. dead people i've seen like i said i worked in the medical industry since what 97 so i've seen a lot of a little bit a lot seen, of stuff yeah the emergency room but i remember you guys listen this is a good story Are fast sure? forward it to yeah this is an eerie story also 
So one night I was working in the emergency room. We had a patient came in with chest pain and he has, has history of an aortic aneurysm. Aortic aneurysm is just a bulge and, and it's on the main vessel that feeds your body its blood supply. Mm. Okay. So the doc on that night calls the surgeon and asks him what should he do with this guy? And should he prep him to take him right down to the OR or what should he do? He said, get a CAT scan first, because of course they want to see how big the, a, you know, the aneurysm is before they re go in to do surgery or if does it need surgery or not. Right. And before I tell the rest of the story, they have machines that are portable that you can bring to do this. Said, no, take them down to get a CAT scan and then we'll make a decision from there. Right. We took the guy to CAT scan. I kid you not, I am in his face, maybe two, two feet away from him because he's on the, on the table. Right. Before we moved him to the CAT scan table, we moved him over to the CAT scan table, started to move him. He made a sound like, oh, just like that. No, no bullshit. And he looks me, I'm in his face because I'm helping him onto the CAT scan table. He said, am I going to die? He died within seconds of him telling me that. Oh, wow. Because the aneurysm burst and all the blood that's supposed to be feeding his body is, right. is not going anywhere, but filling up his Probably. chest cavity. Yeah. Wow. No saving. You can't save a person from that. Nope. Can't even put a temporary. That's what, nope. You have to catch it before it bursts like that. That's yeah. what John Ritter died from. Oh my goodness. Isn't that a creepy story? That is creepy. He was dead looking eye to eye with me. And when he said that, and he just was gone. How did you feel? Weird. Well, I can tell you this. Because it can't I, be, oh, just another day. No, it's not. that. I think that's one of the things working in an emergency room that affected me the most because it was kind of personal because mm -hmm. I'm, I mean. You're touching. Yeah, not, not just touching. It's because he's asking me this question mm -hmm. as he's looking at me in his face. Sure. But when you work in a field like that and as being a paramedic or being someone that's working, works in trauma, right? you get desensitized, desensitized to a lot of things. Right. And so I did feel kind of messed up, but I could still brush it off because do you remember how busy I worked in trauma? Yeah. And we were constantly. So it was another trauma. So after. it was just sort of another trauma. Right. At that time. That one just resonated because it was so. Yeah. Because it was more, more personal. Intimate. Yeah. 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 There you go. That's a better word for it. It's more right. intimate. Wow. That's all the stories I have for today. Do you Not have any story. stories? No. All right. So I, what I forgot to say at the beginning of the show, that which I should have said, that I should always say, I should tell everybody that they should follow me on Spotify and subscribe on iTunes and start listening. Listen. And just listen. We want people to be interactive with the show. So you can always email me a story at jwcarterfilmworks at gmail.com. Join the Facebook group, Mysteries and Beliefs Podcast with John Carter. Send me a message. Be a part of the world. Be a part of the conversation. We want to start hearing from some people. We're not going anywhere, just keeping it moving. What say you? That's what I say. Follow. Follow. What, what, what do you say again? Like and subscribe? Yeah. Oh, like, share, and subscribe. Like, share, and subscribe. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Until the next episode. No, you think so. Not, I don't think so. Till the next episode. Oh, jeez. Goodbye. Dr. Dre.